And I said, so how much would it cost you to hire somebody to do all the minutia in your business? And he's like, probably forty or $50,000. I said, you're telling me for $50,000, you can buy your life back? <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Entrepreneurship Exposed, hosted by your guy, Bees, where we talk about everything related to entrepreneurship, but always with a twist of mergers and acquisitions. Now, before I introduce our guest today, I have to tell a little quick story. I, in the very beginning, as I was trying to find my way in entrepreneurship, right, even before, actually, when I was still in my nine to five, I used to always say I didn't like Tony Robbins. And... You know, everybody was like, well, you don't like Tony Robbins. I was like, yeah, because, you know, Tony Robbins is, if you believe, you can achieve and blah, blah. And that's all cool, but I wanted to know how. I needed, I needed some more, you know, some tangible information, not just this motivational stuff that I already had the motivation. But then as time goes on, and some of you may have heard the story before, but as time went on, I realized that, now nah, you know what, Tony is not actually selling motivation. It's more mindset. And I realized very early on how important mindset is to being an entrepreneur, period. Regardless of if you follow the path that I've gone as an investor and focus on acquiring businesses, or you decide to go the startup route and take your chances with, you know, more than 80% of businesses are, are gone in, in five years when they start up. So it led me to realize that this mindset is so important. And I, that's why I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Because we're not going to go into a, just one specific area of entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about that resilience that is necessary to be an entrepreneur. And it all starts with the mindset. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll join me in welcoming our guest today, Mr. Brian Will. How you doing, Brian? Bees, I am so excited about doing this podcast. I love this, man. This is going to be fun. Oh, awesome. See, I could tell a real entrepreneur when they get excited about it. They're like, oh. Go in and, you know, <laughs> it's actually rock and roll. This rock and roll is it's a fun topic, although there's some scary aspects of it, right? So I'm looking forward to hearing your, your perspective on this. But let's start by, you know, introducing yourself. Tell the people more about who you are and how you came to where you are today. Gosh, bees, my background is so long and varied. I'll try to squeeze this into about 45 seconds. It's called <laughs> 35 Years of Entrepreneurship. Uh, although I started out as a high school kid who got who failed out at 16, Managed to get back in, got kicked out of the house at 18, joined the military because I had no place to go. Tried to get a job afterwards, kept getting fired. Finally decided I was such a terrible employee, I should probably start my own business. And that's what I did. And my first business was a struggle. I had no idea what I was doing. I failed, I failed. And then it started doing good. And I, as I like to say, it did good until it didn't. And then that business collapsed. I lost everything, my house, my cars, my health insurance, my daughter needed open heart surgery. I couldn't pay for it. But you know what? You still press on. And so 20 years after that first failure, two venture capital exits, one private equity exit, consulting to Fortune 500 companies, public and private, wrote four books, got into politics, owned a chain of restaurants. I mean, I've done so many things. I can't remember all of them. And that brings <laughs> me to where we are today. And the culmination of my career is I'm on your podcast. This is awesome. Hey, yeah, I love the, you know, uh, flattery will get you everywhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I love that condensed story, right? Because it started off in the beginning with you realize that you weren't a, a, a good employee. And yep. then I have a lot of people who feel that, well, if I'm not a good employee, I don't know if I'd be a good, you know, owner of a business. I'm like, why, why? the two are not, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not mutually they are mutually exclusive, actually. You, you, it has nothing to do with how you would run the business versus how you work for somebody else. Uh, right. Because I, if I think about it for myself, I think I wasn't that great of an employee either because I always had ideas on what else should be done and it wasn't being implemented. So I was just like, well, whatever, we're going to do it this way and it's not going to work. <laughs> so that's not the best employee. But, but that, start, that was the start of your resilience. Yes. Right. And, and so so dig a little bit into what really helps you or helped you to get through those tough, those failures or I, I don't even like to call them failures, those lessons. What helped you to get through those to keep pushing through? 
All right, guys, before we get into the full episode of Entrepreneurship Exposed, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for supporting this channel. This channel means so much to me. You all mean so much to me because this information is the type of things that I wish that I knew when I was like 17 years old. Right? We're talking about wealth creation strategies, not plays. Never talking about, hey, we could run this quick play to make some quick money. This is all about sustainable strategies that won't go anywhere. Whatever else you may be doing, this information will supplement it and help you take it to a whole nother level. So what I would love to ask each and every one of you is if you could like, comment, subscribe, turn on the notification bell, do all of that for me. It supports the channel, it helps us to grow, helps us to get this information out to more people so that we could change more lives. So thank you again for supporting. Make sure that whatever you see in here, whatever you learn in here, that you go and execute on it. And then drop a comment and let me know how it went out for you. Hopefully I'll even see you in the BBI where I teach how to acquire businesses and everything about entrepreneurship. Let's go. What helped you to get through those to keep pushing through? Gosh, there's there's so much in uh, inside that question. But you know, if you go back to when I was uh, young and then I got started in my own business, I had a chip on my shoulder about the size of a small car, right? And so I had all these, in my mind, all these people who had told me I wasn't worth it, all these people who told me I couldn't do it, all these, my fit teachers who failed me. I had all this pent up anger in, inside of me, but mm -hmm. I used that anger to push me forward. And I think that's, that's a huge key for some people. In fact, I'm, I'm doing a TED talk next week. It's called Your Past Is Not Your Future. Um, and you have to learn how to take whatever it is that's happened to you, right? I call it taking responsibility for the things you aren't responsible for and use it in some way to push you through the tough times, right? So I was married. I had a kid, needed open heart surgery. I didn't have a choice. When my business failed and everything collapsed around me and I lost everything, you're either going to curl up in a ball or you're going to go back out there the next day and go at it again. And that's what I did. So um, you just have to push, 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 right? In order to uh, overcome all the things that you think are holding you back to get you where you need to go. I, I, man, I love that. You about to make me cry. It makes me, <laughs> it makes me think back to certain things, some of the challenges I had to go through. And you know, I always tell people that the our quality of life is dependent on how we react to the things that happen to us, right? Because you know, these, these challenges happen to us and then it's like, oh my God, I'm defeated. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm depressed. I stay here. I'm not going to go work. I'm not going to the gym. I'm not doing anything. I, I'm just going to stay here. And, oh, I understand that everybody needs, you know, to take a moment. Take I 10 minutes. Moment, yeah. And cry, <laughs> whatever you want to yeah. do. But how do we now change the situation that we're in? What are the steps I need to start taking to eventually uh, get to a better situation. And not everybody does that. Why, why right. do you think that is? Let me tell you something. I, this is part of part of what I talk about a lot, right? So at my age, I'm 58. I'm an old guy now. But I can look back over my life and I can tell you that every bad thing that ever happened to me turned into something better. Yes. Now, take that statement as a background. And the next thing I'm going to tell you is, have you ever heard the phrase that every time a door closes, another door opens? Open, open, You've yes. heard that. Like Everybody's heard that. But here's the question. Did the door open because oh, yes. the next open door? Let's go, Brian. That's what. Let's go, Brian. That's what. For the open door, they just give up or they yeah. they think, oh, my. They think, oh, my. You need to start looking for the next open door because the door is. The open door because the door is. The Things in the moment. You don't see the fact that when my fact that when my that mm -hmm. forced me to change industries and go into insurance. And mm -hmm. because I went into insurance, and mm -hmm. because I went into insurance something and I got acquired by a venture capital firm, acquired by a venture capital firm, I would not have got into insurance. I would not got into a venture capital deal, mm -hmm. which venture capital deal, which I got to tell you, I hated landscaping, but when it failed, I didn't, but when it failed, I didn't see all the things that turned into something better. And even people who work for me, they say, oh, work for me. They say, oh, I have no idea what's going to happen next. Something better. Next. 
something and, better. Yes. And everything's going to be okay. I love that. I, I love that. I mergers and acquisitions in there um, and develop other and develop other who will go into different acquisitions with me. And I talk about with me and I talk about Life is, de is determined by how you react to things. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is this. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to manifest my great life. The thing with manifesting it is that people start with the visual. That's how we manifest it. You got to first see yourself in it. But then so, so many people stop there. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. manifesting means like I'm just going to think about it. Is this going to happen? No. Manifest means making it happen. So going to execute. Doors, looking for those doors that open up, yeah. not just waiting for them to open up, executing, like you said. Yeah. I love that you were mentioning that. You know, I'm just, I'm actually just taking it as justification and vindication. I'm vindicated for, you know, <laughs> telling my community that for the longest. But, but I love it. I love it. So you, you basically then got into an exit. Right. Let's, I'm, I'm going to jump to that since we love the M&A side of it. Right? Having no idea that it was going to happen. Yes. So you did not go in planning for an exit. Right. No, I'll, I'll tell you the quick story, Bees. So mm -hmm. I started selling insurance, health insurance back then. And this mm -hmm. was pre-internet. Right. Mm -hmm. And we used to have to go door to door and go see people and get wet signatures and collect physical checks. And I've always, call, I've always called myself ambitiously lazy. It's one of my favorite terms. And that means I'm willing to work really hard to figure out how to not work hard. Oh, and so, like <laughs> and so I kept, I'm going door to door, but people half the time wouldn't be there. And I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. So I called this insurance company I was working for. And I said, Hey, can I just, instead of going to see them, do it by fax. And they said, nobody's ever done that before. And I said, Oh, well, I want to try. And they said, all right, well, we'll let you try. You're the only guy in the country. We're going to let try this. And a year and a half later, I was the second largest insurance agency in the country with five people in my office competing against field operations with hundreds because we were sending faxes out, faxes back, doing everything over the phone. And they were like, holy crap, this is unbelievable. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? This was 1999, the dawn of the internet. And these internet companies are trying to figure out how to sell insurance online. And I'm the only guy out there doing it on a fax. And they said, we want to acquire you. And so oh. I got acquired just like that. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in, so oh. I got acquired just like that. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in Sand Hill Road in a venture capital firm talking about how to revolutionize the health insurance industry. I had no idea that's what I was doing when I did it. All I knew was I didn't want to drive around town. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> I love that. I love it. So you, I don't want to say that you fell into it, into that, act, into that exit, but it's kind of like you fell into it, right? It, it's it, a lot of times people think for an exit and a, a, an acquiring company to be interested in you, you have to have some sort of IP or some some very specific technology that's been, especially nowadays everybody thinks yeah mm -hmm. have some very specific technology that you're doing that no one else is doing to be acquired that's not the case and in in your case it was a process related thing because yeah. your process was more efficient and it led to more revenue they were like hey we want this this company so, so well, I, yeah I love well it. then it took one step further now that we have all this venture capital money behind us mm -hmm. and we're trying to sell insurance to these people online we came up with another idea is why don't we just provide our technology platform to the current insurance carriers and their hundreds of thousands of agents yes. and let yes. them use our product instead of us just using it by ourselves. Yes. And the next thing you know, we raised more money. We sold the very first health insurance platform online. That company ended up going public and it's, you know, it provides majority of the Medicare data behind the Medicare scenes today. Just, it, it, hey, I got a better idea. And we went out and did that. And then we did it again and again with different companies. But success is a progression, bees, as you know. I always like to say IBM started off selling typewriters. DuPont started off selling dynamite. Mm. Everything you do in business is a progression. If you just get better and better at what you do, um, you're going to be in good shape. If you don't, that's when companies tend to get in trouble. Definitely, definitely. I love it. And, you know, we got to go back for a second to your, uh, what was it, uh, something lazy what did you have? Ambi it ambitiously lazy ambitiously lazy okay so i'm going to steal that from you every now and then but i will always <laughs> give you credit for it i'll say you got I it. Will, brian will ambitiously lazy and here's the reason why i want to um dive into that a little bit more my goal and i talk about it on the all the time on the internet is 
Uh, I don't want to be the CEO of nothing. And everybody loves the, that word. I want to be the CEO. I want that, you know, Very sexy. Stuff. And I'm like, no, that's another job. And honestly, yeah. my goal is not necessarily financial wealth. It's time wealth. Freedom. I want my time back, my freedom. Yeah. So if that's the case, I'm going to make certain decisions that may not provide me the most revenue, but it'll provide me the most time back. And, and I, I based this whole concept for me um, on the uh, cash flow quadrant in the book, uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Yep, yep, yep. And moving from employee to self-employed, then to business owner. But too often people stay at business owner. I'm the CEO now. I got some of my time back because I'm not trading. I'm not working in the company. I'm working on mm -hmm. the company and I'm steering yep. the ship. But then we uh, too often we forget about that I, the, the uh, investor quadrant. Yep. Now you don't have to work on the company either. I can work above it. I yep. can hire the CEO. All right. Hey, I, I want to give you another concept, Bees. Let's go. I, I just did a, a video on this recently and I talked exactly about what you're talking about. But in my in my mind, some people make the mistake of trying to move from entrepreneur to self-employed to business owner to investor, thinking that they have to be in one quadrant. When the oh, reality yes. is in my own personal, I have a coaching business, which is self-employed. Yeah. I have a restaurant chain, which I work, it's my business, and yes. I have a real estate portfolio that I invest in. So I technically sit in three categories within the four quadrants uh, of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I love that. I love that. That reminds me of another um, uh, quote. You know the quote, uh, a jack of all trades is a master of none? Yes. But the, the true quote is a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. And people forget that. Or ah, they just yeah, I've it. never heard that. That's awesome. It, it, people just leave off that other part. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I don't I, I don't need I don't have to be the expert in the marketing of my company. Right. But I want to know enough so that I'm not getting yes. screwed over or something, but I'm going to hire the experts. Right. Yes. So I'm fine with being in You're you're perfectly right. I'm fine with being in multiple of those quadrants. Not the uh, top left, though. But <laughs> no employee. Those, are, those last three, I'll take <laughs> I'm fine with being in there, but as long as it's done in a way that still can help me to get, you know, uh, maximize yeah. the time that I get back and, you know, of course, the revenue to help me to do so. I'll give you another one, Bees. This is a good one. I just, I just filmed a, a competition TV show out in Tulsa last week. It's going to be on this summer. I was a judge there. Awesome. And I was, I was telling these entrepreneurs that, um, about the four the four uh, steps of delegation, right? Four steps of delegation. If you're going to build a company and you want to you want to keep yourself out of having to work 70, 80 hours a week, mm -hmm. first you delegate the admin, then marketing, then sales, and then executive. Mm -hmm. I said, now, once you move to that delegation and the executive level, it's going to cost you money, right? Because you're mm -hmm. going to have to hire somebody to be the executive in your company. Mm -hmm. But let's say you have a company that's doing good revenue, making good money, and you can hire somebody at $150,000 a year. Yeah. In this case, I was talking to an entrepreneur and I said, how much would, how much time are you spending doing $25 an hour tasks? Mm. Right. He said, I probably work 60 hours a week and 40 hours a week. I'm working doing administrative stuff. Yeah. And I said, so how much would it cost you to hire somebody to do all the minutia in your business? And he's like, probably 40 or $50,000. I said, you're telling me for $50,000, you can buy your life back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and I said, 50 grand. He goes, yeah, actually, that's true. I said, yeah, you could go from 60 hours a week to 10 or 20 for mm -hmm. 50 grand. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I never thought of it that way. Buy your life back. It's going to cost you some money, but what, what's more important? Yes, exactly. But you see what you just described is perspective, right? Another, I'll give you one too. Often people will go to college for five or more years and be broke during that time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely dirt broke. I got two kids. I know. <laughs> and, and, and they're doing it for the opportunity, the chance to make a middle class income. Yeah. But they go into starting a business and three months in, it's not making money. And they're like, I give up. It's not going to work. But hey, these, you, you ever see? heard of the you ever heard of the 20 year overnight success? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Same here. Same here. You know, Dude, people come it, to me now. 
it it took me good. 20 years. I asked, I asked, you know, I'm, I talk to these college kids, right? I'm like, yeah. are you willing to work your rear end off for the next 15 to 20 years to have everything you want in life? Yes. And they're like, but I thought it'd be fast. I want to, I want it now. I want to like, I, maybe you will, maybe you're better than me and everybody else I know. But I was broke for the first 15 years before we figured out how to be successful. Yes. And now I have things that most people don't have planes and cars and boats and beach places and lake places. And, but it took me forever to get there. Are you willing to put that much time and effort in if needed? Exactly. And, it, you know, I love this conversation. I feel like, you know, we're just bouncing back and forth on this because here goes the next thing, right? Uh, go, continuing with perspective. Um, there's, there's a statistic, and I mentioned it earlier, that, that more than 80% of the businesses that start up are gone in five years, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, if you go by the SBA 7A loan, which is the business acquisition loan, the failure rate of acquisitions is uh, less than 2%, all right? Obviously, there's private money and things, and we don't have insight into that, and it, it could be a higher rate, but less than 2% from the SBA uh, 7A. <clears throat> Knowing those statistics, I had a student once who, let, let's say it was January, they joined the community, started learning mergers and acquisitions, and by August, they were like, I don't think this is working for me. I've tried and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not working. And I said, okay, well, how many people have you spoken to? And they were like, like three, three people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and then here's the, the kicker after me telling them that, uh, well, no, it's a numbers game. You know, um, I speak to, I find a hundred potential deals. I speak to 20 of those hundred and then uh, I end up with one or two, but that's one or two multi-million dollar companies. So the, this same student, within another two or three months, got into an LOI on a potential deal. And they mm -hmm. were so happy. And I was like, OK, so it took you about nine months to get to a multi-million dollar company when most people don't even get to seven figures in revenue and most businesses are gone in five years. Mm -hmm. Don't you see the, benefit, the, 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 the perspective here? But th that's a, another um, issue that people don't you know, they, they, they don't want to wait for the time, right? Yeah. You, you're telling them that, yeah, it's going to take some time, but they're like, but I need it now. Yeah. Well, that time goes a lot faster than you would really think. Overall, yeah. Wouldn't you say? I, 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 I got lots of these stories, but I got yes. one. I went to buy this restaurant and uh, the guy says, I want 300 grand. And I said, I'll give you two. And he said, no. Comes back a year later. He says, I'll take two. I said, no, I'll give you one. And he says, no, he comes back a year later. He says, I'll take one. So this has been a two and a half year process. And I said, all right, let's go through the due diligence. So we go through the due diligence on this deal. And in the due diligence, I found that he had already taken another job. He was ready to move. His franchise agreement was coming due and his rent uh, lease had to be re-signed in the next 60 days. And I, I, was, I was, so I went to the, I went to him. I said, look, I'm not even going to give you one now. I'm going to give you zero. And he goes, what, what do you mean? Zero. I can't take zero. I said, well, I know in 60 days you're moving, your lease expires and your franchise agreement's up. So what's my offer? And he's like, I can't take zero. I said, all right, I'll give you 10 grand. He goes, done. Wow. So <laughs> don't fall in love with a deal. There's always another one, right? Yes. Do your research, find out why the person's selling their business because you never know. I heard 75% of businesses that go for sale never sell anyway. Yep. Right. Exactly. And the other 25% generally don't sell for what they were asking. Yep. In this case, I was willing to wait it out. And I got a business that was doing $1.2 million a year in revenue and making six figures in profit. And I bought it for 10 grand. <laughs> I, I just need to come and speak to my uh, students in the community because <laughs> they need to hear these things to see that it's not just me. I love it. I love no, it. No, it's but, that, that and there, I have more deals like that. It's amazing. Yeah. You just have to take the time. Don't get emotionally involved and work those things. And, and eventually you'll, they'll just, you'll get them. So elaborate a little bit more on how you got into the um, uh, acquisition side of things. Because after you had your exit, um, you know, what really happened to then shift you to say, hey, let me start buying some companies too. Well, in this case, my first ones I started buying were restaurants. And that's a cliche for people who end up selling a company, making a lot of money and everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to go buy a restaurant or a bar. I was going to be, I was going to be Sam Malone from Cheers, if you remember that show. Hey. You know, the bar and you know, hey, Norm, how's it going? Hey. And uh, so I did and uh, bought my first one. Literally, we're sitting in a bar. I always used to take my employees out for happy hour mm. and they were like, you know, we come to happy hour three nights a week. You should buy a restaurant. And I was like, that's a good idea. 
So find <laughs> one. And the next day they were like, oh, the restaurant we were sitting in last night's for sale. And I said, buy it. So we within two weeks, we owned it. So I own this bar now and I'm in there being an idiot, standing up with the band on the weekends, pretending like I could sing and giving drinks away. And after a year, I'd lost like $75,000. And I thought, well, that wasn't as much fun as I thought it would be. So I bought four more because that's what we do as entrepreneurs. We quadruple down. <laughs> I figured if I had more, I could make more money. <laughs> and I bought them, by the way, for $0. That's another story I didn't tell you. There we because go. I, we bought, here's, here's a key for you. If you want to do acquisitions at this level, these look for distressed owners, not distressed businesses. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. distressed owners means you have a decent business with a bad owner yep. versus a bad business. You don't want a bad business. You want yeah. a bad owner. Yeah, and I yeah. found four more restaurants with a distressed owner and I ended up acquiring, you know, almost $6 million in revenue on those four. And then sold the first one. And then I figured out how to run restaurants. And I've had 15 since then. And I still own a, a four of them. So awesome. distressed awesome. business, not a distressed owner, or distressed owner, not a distressed business. That's the key. How would you do? So I focus on or what I've been calling it and focusing on is motivated sellers, right? How would you differentiate between distressed seller versus motivated seller? Is there a difference or? You, nope. You know, Most you distressed know. owners are motivated. motivated. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure. <laughs> But you got to look at the books. If you look at the books and you see a solid set of bones right there, this is something that's actually working. But I can see that the owner is just making bad decisions yeah. for whatever reason. In this case, this guy had $2,000 in bounce check charges in the first 10 months mm. of the year. Oh, wow. Okay. And I was like, what the heck? And then I realized what was going on. I, the owner was, he was doing things he shouldn't be doing and wasn't paying attention. And his father had passed on and left him this business and he didn't know how to run it. Yeah. And I'm looking at it going, this is a gold mine. So mm -hmm. we ended up getting him out and getting me in. You know, you ever read a book called uh, The Alchemist? Mm -mm. No. In it, it talks about, um, there's a famous saying, saying from it, a famous quote, and I may get a little bit wrong, but something like, when you really want something, the, the whole universe conspires to make it happen, right? So yep. when you're fully focused on, I want this, I want that, everything just starts happening, just falling into place. It, it, it's kind of like that manifesting and the open doors to start opening. It's the open end. doors. Exactly, right? So I'm, ta I'm looking at that right now because what you just described um, fits a, a, an acquisition or a potential acquisition that I just looked at this week. And great and if everything is accurate it's great mm -hmm. but the owners are you know baby boomers they're like in their 70s they're retiring they hate technology mm -hmm. their books are non-existent they they're <laughs> like they're like listen you can look at the bank statements and our tax yeah. return that's the only two things we got there's no pnls there's no balance sheets there's no nothing they just really decided to even give quickbooks a try the, uh, right. in the last few weeks so, but you know, at first I'm like, ah, this is, even if it does work, prove to be a good business, it's going to be a whole lot of due diligence for me to go through. And I was like, ah, maybe yep. not. but I think now the universe has put Brian will in front of me. <laughs> and say, hey, you know what? This is a distressed owner. Go ahead and just explore it. It could be a huge boom for you. So thank you if, you. if you've got access to even somewhat of good information, you can piece together a P and L I I've, I've I listen, if you know how to run a business, you know how to run a business, right? Yeah. So my expertise has never been in what I call the tactical side, mm -hmm. tactical, meaning the technical, I'm sorry, yeah. the technical side, which is like, I don't know how to cook. Yeah. Literally. I don't know how to make drinks. If I go into my restaurant, I don't know how a seating chart works. I don't know anything <laughs> about running a restaurant, nothing, but I know how to run a business. There you go. <laughs> okay. So if you know how to run a business, you generally know how to run a business. I'm the operations guy. I work in the back end. I can look at a PL on a business and tell you what's right and what's wrong because this is what I do in my coaching practice without ever stepping foot in your business. And in your case, if you've got a business like that, if you can piece together the bones of revenue, where the revenue come from, expenses, where the expenses come from, you can piece that together. You can tell whether a business is viable or not yeah. uh, pretty easily because PLs, numbers, they tell the story. So, definitely. Uh, and, and, I mean, Ultimately, I have a team to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it won't be as bad. It just won't be as quick as my uh, other acquisitions. But yeah, yeah I, I have renewed hope for it now after this. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, cool. So you, uh, we understand how you got into M&A. Yep. Um, 
what is next for Brian Will? Because I know that you have a, another book coming out soon, right? I do. So the book I have coming out is called uh, The Invisible Multimillionaire. So two books ago was The Dropout Multimillionaire. That was me. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote the book on sales, which is called No, The Psychology of Sales and Negotiation. Mm -hmm. And now The Invisible Multimillionaire. And by that, I mean, if you're going to sell your company, you need to be the invisible person behind the scenes, yes. right? So it's the invisible multimillionaire. It's how to prepare your company for a sale to create generational wealth. That's what the book is about. Yeah. And it's both, uh, there's two people, me writing it from my perspective of building and selling companies. And then my friend, Jeff, who uh, Jeff in the last five years has done over $1 billion in M&A deals for his clients, a billion. Most of his deals are in the 20 to $100 million range. They close about a deal a month now. And he walks through examples of this is what the entrepreneur or the founder did right. This is what they did wrong. This is what we had to fix. This is what we had to clean up. Here's how you get better multiples. These are the things you need to put in place. Mm. So my experience in doing it, his experience in, in selling those into private equity, mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a really good book in the M&A space. I'm looking for That's not Jeff Leviton, is it? No, I know Jeff Leviton, but no, this is Jeff yeah. Arkins. Oh, okay, okay. Well, but yeah, that, that's I'm looking forward to that book now, right? Because you know that is part of my specialty in terms of the operational side and making sure yep. things are efficient. And uh, I, I look at the invisible millionaire millionaire as the business needs to be able to run without you. Yes, it needs to be able to uh, not be dependent on your name, your your yes. activities, nothing like that. You need yes. to also you don't have to be the face of the business. Yes. The business needs to have its brand is the face of the you business. You are the invisible multimillionaire. Exactly. exactly. Nobody so wants to buy your business if you are the sole holder of knowledge, the yeah. sole connection to all of your customer base. Yeah. That's worth nothing. If you're the person that has to do all the, the work. That has mm -hmm. no value because they know if they give you a bunch of money and you go sail off into the Caribbean, the business falls apart. Business so you've got to be invisible. There we go. There we go. So what next big acquisition are you, uh, you know, leaning towards? Is there a specific industry, uh, you know, anything along those lines? You know, uh, because my new business I launched about six, eight months ago is more in the fractional COO, fractional CSO side and doing this executive coaching. Um, I've started working with a fair number of clients and helping them scale and prepare. Mm -hmm. um, so my next thing is really gonna be continuing down that path and maybe doing uh, consulting for equity and helping people get their businesses ready to roll. Well, in some of the roll-ups that I'm doing, we're always looking for great uh, fractional executives, especially fractional CEOs and such. So. Yep. We, have, we have more to discuss then than I thought. So. We got to talk. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. All right. So I, I think it's time we got to pop what entrepreneurial resilience is. I mean, we're talking about everything about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. right now. We got to talk about the pros, opportunities, and problems of entrepreneurship and how do we handle, you know, the challenges, mm -hmm. the lessons that we yep. learn. So go ahead and, and start with the pros. The pros of entrepreneurship, oh my gosh, if you build it correctly, you can buy your life back, you can buy your freedom. Listen, I just got back from 10 days of skiing in Park City and I was be skiing down the mountain, pull into a lift and while you're standing there waiting, I'd get a text and I'd be like, oh, okay, let me fix that problem. <laughs> Put my phone away and I'd go back up the mountain. Back up the mountain. Let's yeah, you wanna, you wanna create a life where you can do your business anywhere in the world? I'm thinking about getting on a ship for nine months and doing a round the world cruise. All I need is the internet. I can run any business anywhere, do any coaching. That's called delegation and getting out of your business and being the invisible multimillionaire. That's the pro of doing it. There we doing go. It. There we go. I, I'm a, I wish I could do that, but um, I have little kids too. So <laughs> I still gotta <laughs> wait for grown. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Hire everything out. Let's go. Delegate everything. <laughs> All right. So I love I love that. And that's definitely one of the biggest pros. Is you, and you know, I've told you as well, Brian, that my big thing is I want my time back, right? And, yeah. and it's funny because the more uh, uh, I guess of a celebrity, I hate even using that term, but the more I'm known now yep. is more, is the less time I'm getting back. And everybody's like, Oh, I thought you were all about getting your time back. Yeah, I was, but then, you know, all of this stuff happened and it, at least it's the things that I like. And it's not just, you know, going crazy with work, but here's your answer. Say, look, I'm spending that time giving it to you. So stop complaining. There we go. Right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Okay, let's go into the opportunities, things that are coming up 
uh, you know, in the near future, whether it's, whether it's a political thing, economical thing, whatever it may be, why people need to take advantage of this opportunity of being an entrepreneur uh, right now. My goodness. Uh, somebody asked me this question the other day. What's the difference between today entrepreneurship and when you did it? And I said, oh, my gosh, do you understand that today? Let me ask you a question, Bees. Mm. If I could put somebody in your business that had read every single book on success on planet Earth and knew every single millionaire, multimillionaire and billionaire and knew every speech ever given at a TED talk and literally had every piece of information that you need in order for you to be successful. Would that be a good person to have in your business? Hey, I are you kidding me? You know what it's called? It's called chat GBT and the internet. Yes, it sir. knows everything. You need an idea. It takes 10 seconds to pop in and say, Hey, give me an idea on this. And boom, there's your idea. Now you run with it. So the opportunities for people today to get into your own business and be an entrepreneur and scale and, and make money are, are a million billion times stronger but that from back when I was having to drive around door to door, knock, 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 mm -hmm. Mrs. Smith, are you home? Can I sell you some insurance? I mean, the opportunities are amazing today. It's amazing. 100%. And, you know, going back to the back in the daytime, even in starting a business, I remember, you know, I tried to start this one business and, and I had to get uh, some servers and I had to, because we had to, you know, have mm -hmm. all this internal stuff. This was before AWS became as prominent as it is. And, you know, it was just the startup costs of any yeah. startup business was astronomical then compared to now where you could just literally, hey, just go file with the site on uh, the, the, the um, State Department online real quick and you get their LLC and you're up and running and you just get, you can have some yeah. VAs in the Philippines and you can do all of these different things it's so much easier. So I agree. So whole, much easier, so much opportunity out there. Definitely. And you know, one last thing I'm gonna say with the opportunities before we go to the problems, um, <laughs> this is gonna be a gem for everybody that's listening, right? So one of the things that um, we're doing internally in one of my companies, uh, actually in the BBI, is we're utilizing AI, specifically ChatGPT, where we're able to put in to ChatGPT and create our own custom persona. And that custom persona is being fed information from Warren Buffett, from uh, other great investors, people in the MA space, feed that information into them and create this super investor per persona, mm -hmm. this super investor knowledge, right? Now, when we ask that persona questions, it's going to give answers based on what all of these other amazing investors did. That's and what I'm talking about. You see what I mean? Like, that's yes. absolutely insane. Yes. And on top of that, I could feed it with my own videos and speeches and things mm -hmm. so that if I wanted it in terms of posting content and articles, I could say, hey, write this article with your knowledge as this super investor, but utilize the terms and the vernacular that bees would potentially use. Yeah. And bam, like yeah. that. <laughs> it's I, absolutely amazing. I literally did this last week with another conversation I was having with somebody and we just recorded the whole conversation back and forth, fed it into chat GBT. And I said, organize this into bullet points, highlights, and summaries. And 20 seconds later, I look like a genius. And all we were doing yeah. was chatting with some dude back and forth. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's I love amazing. It. So that is the greatest opportunity, I will say for sure. But yeah. now we got to get into the most important aspect. And that's the problems, right? And I say most yep. important because too often people see all the, the glitz and the glam of everything, including entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you see me driving a Lamborghini, it's like, oh, wow, I want to be an entrepreneur like these. Mm -hmm. You don't know what I had to go through. <laughs> you weren't there when I couldn't pay the bills. Exactly. <laughs> so, so talk about some of the major problems and specifically the resilience to get. Sure. Back. So I'm going to give you a, this is a, this is a little part of my speech, right? So let me ask you a question, Bees. You ever heard the phrase that you have to fail to succeed? Yes, sir. That's BS. Ooh. Ooh. You know what? You can learn. Fail, from failure leads to failure. If all you ever do is fail, all you will ever do is fail. Learning from failure is what propels you to success. Do you know people in your life or your business or your world that can't seem to figure it out and fail at everything they do? Yes, I do. That's because they never learned what they did wrong. Oh. Okay. Learning from failure is how you succeed. Now, keep that in mind for a second. So I do this thing called the 100 Steps to Success. Wherever you are, wherever you want to be. 
And that 100 steps to success are essentially 100 lessons that you need to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's not just 100. I'm making the 100 up as an example. Yeah. But everybody starts out in their entrepreneurial journey at a different level on that 100 yeah. steps. If you have money, you might step at start, start at step five. If you have money in the right parents, it might be 10. If you have mm -hmm. money, parents, and an education, it might be 20. Money, parents, and education, and the right backing, you might start at step 50. Mm -hmm. I started at zero. Other people might start at negative 10. All of us have a set of lessons that we need to learn to get to where we want to go. And if we will stay resilient and not quit, and learn from every failure. You will work your way up that ladder of lessons until you get to the top. I said this earlier, I'm a 20 year overnight success. I mm. failed miserably, lost everything mm. for years and years and years because I had more lessons to learn than you do. I put mm -hmm. three or four or five people in a room. Each one of them will have a different set of lessons. And yeah. it may be different than the person beside them. You can't yeah. judge. I love this saying. Don't judge your page one by somebody else's page 20. Yes. You got to start where you start. You, you were dealt a hand of cards and that is what it is. You can either whine and cry about it or you can go learn the lessons you need to learn to get where you want to go. But you can achieve anything you want if you will go through the lessons, understanding that those are just the ones you need to learn and there's no damn shortcut. But if you'll keep pressing forward and keep learning, fail, learn, fail, learn, fail, learn, eventually you will get there. I went from less than 100 grand a year to a million dollars a year in one year because it, we learned and we learned and then boom, it yeah. hit. And from there, I have almost never made less. Wow. So that's the problem. The problem is too many people quit because as you said earlier, they hit the first lesson and they fail and they're like, I don't want to go forward. They hit three or four or five and they're like, it's too hard. I'm just never going to mm -hmm. happen. And they just don't realize that they could have been on step 99 of 100. I had yeah. no idea, no idea the year we went from less than 100 to a million a year in personal income that it was going to happen. I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. I call it, I call it entrepreneurship as like standing on the edge of a cliff and staring into a dark abyss. And there's, there's somebody on your right shoulder going, don't do it. That's usually your friends and family, by the way, because yes. they're afraid. They don't want you to get hurt. Don't do it. Don't do it. You don't know what's down there. And you got your entrepreneur friends over here going, jump, jump, jump. I swear to God, there's rainbows and unicorns at the bottom. And you're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And then you jump. And sometimes you might have to fall for a long time, but I promise if you don't quit, you're going to make it. Oh man, that is a powerful message right there. And so true. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. There, there's a, another book that's actually one of the books that shaped my entire entrepreneurial career. Uh, it shaped my perspective on what could be accomplished. Uh, it's, it's a, you, you're going to chuckle at the name, but it's <laughs> a, <laughs> have you ever heard of a guy named Reginald Lewis? I have not. Uh, so the book is called, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's the story of Reginald Lewis, who was the first black billionaire in America, but nobody knows his name. This guy was the um, Jackie Robinson of business. Okay. He acquired Beatrice Food and Beatrice Foods International or Beatrice International Food uh, in the eighties. Okay. Made him a billionaire. This is a guy from absolutely nothing. Had no money, no nothing. He 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 did. In his corporate career, he became an attorney. So I'm not saying like he was absolutely broke, sure. but he used none of his money because he did an LBO, a leverage buyout, in yep. order to get uh, Beatrice Foods International. And it, he tells, or the story is told in the book about how there was like you know a couple of failures, uh, uh, failed attempts at acquiring other companies before, and then one in particular, I can't remember the name of the company, but one in particular lasted a year and a half, maybe two years of courting back and forth. And then two or three days before closing is when they pulled out. And, you know, he went into a slight depression for a little bit. But then he said, I, I'm just going to consign or resign to the fact that I was not ready. How do I get ready now? Mm -hmm. And that changed everything for him because he was, mm -hmm. and he, it's not that he did anything wrong. It was actually something on the, the seller side that they decided mm -hmm. to pull out. But he still said, no. I'm, I wasn't fully ready. So let me reassess. Let me assess everything that I did. And how do I get ready for that next one? We call this post-failure analysis. Post-failure analysis. 
every single, you can also do post success analysis, but you should do that every single time. Can I tell you one more thing before we jump? Yeah. Yeah. You know, those hundred steps to success I told you about, and everybody's got lessons to learn and you're going to have to go through the lessons you're going to have to go through period. There is a way to skip lessons. There's a way to accelerate your way up that ladder. Mentorship. And it's called coaching and mentoring with somebody who has been there and done that, who can say, hey, bees, don't do that. That's not going to work. Hey, bees, do it this way. That's going to work. Hey, bees, don't do that. Don't do that. And do this. I swear, if you do what I'm telling you, yeah. you will accelerate that timeline significantly. So mm-hmm. I tell entrepreneurs all the time. Tim Cook, who runs Apple, has a board of directors and he has a personal coach. Mm-hmm. One of the smartest guys out there running one of the biggest companies. If he needs that much help, what in the world do you think you're doing, doing it all by yourself? Yes. Get a coach, get a mentor, skip the steps, increase your speed to success. Let's go. That's, that's a powerful way for us to wrap this conversation up. Man, this was an awesome, awesome episode of Entrepreneurship Exposed with my new friend. And we got so much more to talk about. <laughs> well, but, uh, but Brian, tell the people where they, you know, how they can uh, uh, get in touch with you. Where's the best place to communicate with you and any services that you have? Yeah, sure. My website is brianwillmedia.com. Brianwillmedia.com. My books, my podcasts, my blogs, my newsletters, and my new school platform, if you ever heard of that, is on there. Mm-hmm. So all my coaching programs, everything is uh, brianwillmedia.com. BrianWillMedia.com. Okay, we'll make sure we put it down in the description below. But uh, Brian, thank you so much for coming on Entrepreneurship Exposed and helping us to expose what it truly means to be resilient as an entrepreneur. All right. So thank you again. Y'all already should know what to do. I hope everybody knows, right? <laughs> you should already have subscribed. You should already make sure that you're sharing this uh, information, sharing these episodes. Make sure if you're watching on YouTube, you turn on that notification bell too so you don't miss conversations like this with Brian Will. Brian, thank you again so much, and I hope to see you soon on the next episode. These, it was awesome. Thanks, buddy. Uh-